Well, I'm here. I'm here. Praise God. Awesome. I'm here. We're starting at half past six. It's now four minutes to half past six. Uh, there's ten people online already, so say hello. Let's type in some stuff. I'm going to say hello too. Look, here we go. Hello. Hello. How are we all? Man, we're doing have a good service this morning. I'll tell you what, my whole family was in the living room praising God to Chris and Vaughn's worship. It was just beautiful. Loved the hymns, loved the new stuff, loved hearing Joel's song, loved it all. Loved it all. Praise God. <clears throat> my voice is a bit stronger than what it was this morning because we're going from faith to faith. From strength to strength and from glory to glory. Hi, Youngsome family. Good to see you guys. Hi, Mark. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Den and Jen. Hi, Chris and Vaughn. Man, we've got a few people coming on right now. That's awesome. We've got about three minutes, three minutes until we really hit half past. You know, but what a joy. What a joy it's been to be able to minister to the saints of God, minister to the people of God this week, and uh, really just get the word out to people. And um, it was wonderful. You know, it's not ideal. I'd, I'd love to be in the cinema this morning. I'd love to be driving to, I don't even know what week it is tonight. Is it Cambridge tonight? Is it, am I up to Nuneaton? Am I off to Dorset? I don't know where I should be. Maybe I'm in Brentwood, preaching in Brentwood. I don't know. Maybe we'll start a new church out of this. <laughs> awesome. Praise God. I'll tell you, watch this space. Church number seven is going to launch very quickly, very, very quickly. Excuse me, after we got a lockdown, I just sense it in my bones. I've been praying, I've been believing. We're not going to survive this lockdown, people. We're going to thrive in this lockdown. Survive means we get through it and we're not dead. Thrive means we get through it and we're richer and we're happier and we're more joyful and our marriages are sweeter and our families are stronger. We've got more money in the bank. We've got more money in the pension. We've got more money everywhere. We've got a better car, better house, better life, man alive. Yeah. You know, we're dealing with some at the moment in one of the churches and their landlord's just kicking out of the house. You can't stay with us anymore. Middle of lockdown. But God's provided a place, a better place. You know, God is a good God, we've had people get jobs in the middle of this lockdown. There's no jobs. There's no work. Uh, we've seen people heal the coronavirus. We are seeing stuff happen. And uh, even my voice coming back. Praise God. Awesome. Praise the Lord. How are we all doing? Guy Michelle are here. Dan and Jen were so blessed this morning. That's really lovely to hear that, Dan and Jen. I really appreciate you guys so much. Guys, guys, what are you doing? You keep WhatsApp in all the groups. Get off WhatsApp and get on here. Man, alive. I love you all, but I keep coming up here with the WhatsApps, man. Uh, Guy Michelle here. Corwin's here. Hi, Corwin. Kay's here. Man, alive. Hi, Angela from Dorset. Kay, Anna Sue was amazing reading those notes back today. That was just such a blessing to see that. Rich and Jackie patience and uh, man, alive. Awesome. Okay, are we at half past yet? Not yet. I don't want to start teaching until half past. I don't think that's fair on those people who get here on the dot. I mean, if you get here at 22 and you're late, then tough tough you missed the first 10 minutes um awesome so i've I really enjoyed this season uh champions of faith it's not something i've ever done before it's not something i would have done if the lord hadn't led me and um so last week was ff F. bosworth the week before was john g lake um this morning i got a little bit in about darry dr john darry and uh, maybe we'll study him one day he's, he's not the most encouraging one because he, he starts beautifully but he ends badly but there's a lot to learn from that and a lot we can learn from that because we don't want just ministries that start good. We want ministers that end good. We want to have a church that ends well as well as begins well. You want to have a life that ends well. So maybe we could do some teaching on how to end well and, um, you know, get those things. And then we could look at maybe another minister who did end well, someone like Maria Woodworth Etta or someone who had a long life. You know, Smith Wigglesworth ended well. John G. Lake ended well. Bosworth ended well. And uh, William Seymour, well, I, I don't go too far into the end of his um, it, there, there's a couple of issues near the end of the Azusa Street Revival, um, but it, he ends well enough. He ends well enough. He doesn't end telling everyone he's, John, he's the next Elijah anyway, I'll tell you that. Okay. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Conway family. Isn't that good to see my, my family's upstairs listening in? Bernadette, Jonathan, Lydia, Laura, Leslie, Sharon. Good to see you all on here. That's awesome. Okay. I'm calling it half past now. Um, William Seymour. That's what we're going to talk about today. One of the champions of faith. And if you remember when I started this series and talking about John Lake, I went to Revelation 12, verse 10. I'm just going to turn the fan on. It's something that's quite warm in this room. 
that's too noisy. Let me know and I'll turn it off. But Revelation 12 and verse 10 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. We overcome Satan by the blood, by what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. But we also overcome through words. We also overcome through testimonies. And hearing these stories gives us words. You know, if God will do it for him, he'll do it for you. God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't just like people called Seymour. He loves you. And so when, when you hear these stories, ask God, how can I make these my stories? What do I have to do? How, how can I be like this? How, how can I change? You know, let it not just inspire God. Oh, he was amazing. He was a great man of God. He was so anointed. But let it get deep inside you and help you change and help you grow. Amen? Awesome. Okay. One of the greatest things that really ever happened in church history was what we call the Azusa Street Revival. Azusa Street was a street in Los Angeles, in California, and the revival started in 1906. People traveled from all over the world to be in these meetings. I mean, people, people flew in from all over the world. People got trains. People got trains from all over America. People got boats to be there. People took weeks and months to get there. They came in from all over the world, and the driving force behind the whole Azusa Street Revival was a man called William Seymour, okay? And um, so really important. The Azusa Street Revival started in a stable. It was an old stable that was originally a Methodist church, but the church burnt down, and they used the sort of um, wooden bits of the church to make a stable. And people traveled from all over the world, and the big thing they were preaching, 1906, this was not a big thing. People were not talking about it anywhere, but they were talking about it in Azusa Street, and that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was speaking in tongues. And really, Seymour was the leader of the movement. And it was marked, Azusa Street in 1906, was marked by the fact that it was massive, multicultural, multinational gathering. There were blacks, whites, Hispanics, Europeans, all worshipping God together. There were a lot of Chinese people as well in Los Angeles. They were there too. And in 1906, that did not happen. In 1906, you went to the church of your people. You didn't go to the church with more than one kind of person in it. Okay? That just did not happen in Los Angeles in 1906. And it's tragic that even over 100 years later, there's still churches where everybody looks the same. Where everybody's not just from the same nation, but from the same region, the same tribe, the same tongue, the same everything. And that is not how God intended church to be. And Azusa Street is a real picture of heaven. Now, the actual revival did not last very long. But the whole world is still shaking from the fruit of it. Most Pentecostals and most Charismatics can trace themselves back to Azusa Street. And certainly, my background is Elam or Foursquare. If it wasn't for Azusa Street, there'd be no Elam. There'd be no Foursquare. There'd be no Assemblies of God. There'd be no a whole bunch of these different groups, the Apostolics. None of these groups would exist if it wasn't for Azusa Street. And they were bold in Azusa Street. They were crazy bold. Uh, there was a plague of insects over California at the time. Plague of locusts. There was actually a plague of locusts. And there was other insects as well. There were plagues of insects going around. And uh, so every farmer that was in their church in Azusa Street, they marched over to those fields. They just left the church building and marched to those farmers' fields. And they just stood and they declared the word of God over the fields. And every single time, every single time, every recorded case they did that, the farmer did not lose any crops to the insects. And it would be like the next field would be even just a few feet away, even 20 feet away. And that field would be destroyed, but the Christian farmer's field would be preserved because they stood and proclaimed the word. The insects just wouldn't cross over the line. And uh, loads of unbelievers became believers because the farmers saw their crops got eaten but they didn't see the Christian believing farmers' fields get eaten. And that was the word of God did that. And one night, and I, I found this documented, I'm not just telling stories I've heard, I've heard of a, a mate, but a group of firemen turned up at the Azusa Street Church with fire hoses, and there was no fire. But the people in all the buildings around saw fire, saw tongues of fire on the roof of the building, but there was no fire. It was the glory of God. Okay, so it was a great time. So let's go right back to the roots of William Seymour. Lovely shirt, Pastor Ben. Thank you so much, Pam and Sam. This is my favorite shirt. <laughs> awesome. William Seymour was born in 1870. His parents were called Simon and Phyllis Seymour. Now, you think 1870 America, okay? Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1963. The, Emancip the Emancipation Proclamation was 1860. So slaves were freed 
just with the years of Seymour being born. So his parents, Simon and Phyllis Seymour, they were slaves. His grandparents were slaves. And the end of slavery was not received well in Louisiana. Okay, people were not happy about it. And so William Seymour grew up in a town called Centerville. What a great name for a town, Centerville. And uh, it was in Louisiana. And the Ku Klux Klan were active. And they had what is called the Jim Crow laws. So there was active segregation of the races. And so William Seymour, even as a little boy, got spat at in the street. He wasn't allowed to go to restaurants where there was white people. He wasn't allowed to drink at the water fountain. All the stuff that uh, nearly 100 years after that started the civil rights movement in America. That was all very much William Seymour's experience. The blacks were not allowed to intermingle with the whites, not at the restaurants, not at the workplaces, not at the schools, and even legally, not at church. So churches back then were not just segregated, they were legally segregated, okay? That's the environment he grew up in. Now, although they were fleed, fleed I got my voice back, I don't know, I'm tongue tongued. Let's just speak in tongues for a minute, shall we? Although Seymour's parents were freed from slavery. They had no other life, so they kept working on the plantation. And uh, William grew as a very young boy, even as a six, seven, eight years old, he was working on the plantation. He had no formal education, but his parents were adamant that he would read. So they taught him to read from the Bible. And he just fell in love as a young boy with the Bible. William Seymour absolutely loved the Bible. They used to call him the Bible man, even as a young teenager and preteen, the Bible man. He loved reading about Jesus Christ. He loved that when he, when he found out every Christian was in Christ. He loved that. And he used to pray. And he'd always start his prayers off. He'd always pray to Jesus. And he'd always pray, Jesus, the only liberator of mankind. And they said people who knew him. I mean, it's hard to get records back then of a little black boy growing up in 1870s Louisiana. But the people who knew him said that he was a very sensitive young man. And he loved to read the Bible. He'd read the Bible over and over and then there's stories, again, it's difficult to get sort of documentation to get, you know, to get clarification on some of these stories. Um, some of them differ slightly, but it seems to me they had some sort of open vision as a young man that Jesus Christ was coming back. And he got really excited about Jesus coming back. And he got really excited about preaching the gospel. But at the same time, he had a very strong inferiority complex. And he, as a teenager, he really struggled to see himself as anything other than a plantation worker. He couldn't see himself going into ministry. He couldn't see himself moving from Louisiana. He couldn't see himself doing anything other than just working, very similar to a slave, even though he's free. And just, he, he got very nervous and tongue-tied around new people. And for years, many years, he felt that God was telling him to leave Louisiana, and he didn't. And you've got to realize that's 1870 that he was born. And so 1900, okay, 1900, less than, I think it was 8 or 7% of all the blacks in the South had ever moved. They'd never left home. They'd never moved anywhere. They just didn't, it just wasn't part of their culture. It wasn't part of what they were doing. And there was these Jim Crow laws. Things were very difficult for them. But Seymour felt this call of God to move. And so he did what very few people were doing, especially very few black people were doing, is he left Louisiana. And to cut a long story short, he ended up in Indianapolis in Indiana. Amanda and I have been to Indianapolis. We've preached in Indianapolis. We've pulled someone out of a wheelchair in Indianapolis. Um, and William Seymour arrived in Indianapolis. And, um, you know, he was 25 years old. And what caused him to move was he had a dream or a revelation. Again, it's hard to know. There's different stories. But God communicated with him in some way that man-made shackles cannot hold him. That no shackle made by man can hold someone who's been set free by Jesus. And he decides to move. Now, unlike on the south, William lived in a farm in the middle of nowhere, there's hardly any people about. He's now in this big city in Indiana, and he's trying to get work, but most places are not going to hire a black man. And so he could only get work. He got work as a waiter in a hotel. So now he wants to go to church. So he goes to the Methodist Episcopal Church. That was the only multi-ethnic church in the town. Okay? And uh, he went there, and he, he just loved being in a church when there was white and black and Hispanic people worshipping together. And he just thought that was amazing. He thought that was beautiful. And he had this revelation at first service. This is, what, this is what heaven will be like. There's no color in redemption, he used to say. There's no color in redemption. And so for the next few years, <coughs> he, 
it started getting harder for black people in Indiana. It was like, well, there was only a few of them. That was okay. But when there was, you know, more of them, it started getting harder for them. And it started being impossible for him. And eventually they laid him off work. They said, we don't want any black waiters. We don't want any black people working. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Okay, it's not just a story of how hard his life was. He gets somewhere. And so he moves to Ohio, Cincinnati. Now, remember, he used to go to Methodist Episcopal Church. So now he goes to Methodist Church in Ohio because he likes the Methodists. He likes John Wesley. William Seymour was a huge fan of John Wesley. He used to devour John Wesley's writing. Okay, he used to read Wesley all the time, all the magazines and pamphlets. He would just keep reading the Bible and John Wesley, the Bible and John Wesley. Let's see how everyone's doing. There's no car redemptions. No man-made shackles can hold someone set free by Jesus. Amen. I'm glad this is blessing people. Praise God my voice is back. Amen, Jay. Uh, that's Jermaine, I think. Praise God. I'm glad my voice is back. Amen. Yes, Amanda. Healing is fast and effective. Okay, horrible. I wonder what I was unable to. Probably to some of the racism that he, he went through. And so Wesley wrote these little pamphlets, How to Live for Jesus, How to Be Holy, How to Pray in Faith. And what a lot of people don't realize about John Wesley and the Methodist Church is John Wesley had a phenomenal healing ministry and wrote a lot about healing. And um, Seymour's reading these and getting very excited about healings and miracles. He's never seen one, but he's getting excited for them and getting excited about reading Wesley's books. And also, Wesley preached. He was one of the first preachers after the Reformation to preach like this. But he preached there was no class or color in Jesus Christ. Wesley's meetings were open to everybody. And Wesley made a big deal of that. But imagine this young man, and he's reading all this Wesleyan stuff, and he's reading all the John Wesley material, but he's then going to church, which isn't doing any of it. And he saw his Methodist church was just really going through the form of religion and that there wasn't the same sort of things going on. And there was a lot of people in the church who didn't like him being there as a black man. They didn't like the black man in the white church and he felt very uncomfortable. So he started hunting for a church that was open to all people. He said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I want a church that's open to everyone. I want a church that talks about holiness. I want a church where people pray and get results. And I want a church where the sick are healed. There were the four things he wanted. And he ended up going to a church called the Evening Light Saints. Now, you, you might work out that was a black church. And it was a holiness church. It split off from the Methodist church. And they didn't believe in musical instruments. No musical instruments. They were the devil. They didn't believe in jewelry or makeup. They didn't believe in dancing. And they certainly didn't believe in playing cards. That was a big issue for them. And when you start talking like that, you think, wow, they sound like a really happy bunch, don't they? Man, I wouldn't want to go to that church. But they actually really loved Jesus. And uh, they had a deep joy. And there was, again, it was this multi-ethnic church. And William really liked them. He just liked being around these guys. And they liked him. So in the middle of their worship time, they had this sweet, sweet worship time with it all singing in the spirit, not in tongues, but just sing um, hymns and sing a cappella. But this beautiful, sweet singing with it all sing freely. And um, again, no instruments, but they're all singing together. In the middle of one of those worship times, God speaks to Seymour and says, I want you to be a minister. And uh, you get the impression that God's spoken to him before. It's not the first time God's communicated, and maybe not down that line, but God clearly says to him in this worship service, I want you to be a minister. And he really struggled with that. He didn't feel that he was adequate to be a preacher. He didn't feel like he had the, the capabilities to be a preacher. He, he felt inferior. He felt second best. And he really struggled. He was, he was a man who struggled with identity. Now, in the midst of trying to do and he started praying about it. I don't know what to do. I mean, don't pray about it when God says clearly, I want you to do something. I mean, uh, Seymour was still growing. And that's a lesson we can learn here. But in the middle of all of that, he got smallpox. Now, smallpox was one of the biggest killers of that time. Really, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, smallpox was a massive, massive uh, killer. And if you got smallpox, you died. People did not survive smallpox. Um, but Seymour survived three weeks of absolute agony in bed. And by the time he was got through that, he'd lost sight in his left eye. The smallpox had taken his eyesight off one of his eyes. And his face was just covered in pox scars. And he looked like a mess. And he looked like someone had been very sick. Now, at that time, and again, we're going back a long time in church history, over 100 years, they didn't know some of the stuff that we know now, that we take for granted now. And Seymour believed that God had made him sick. 
that God had said, because you ignored my call, I'm going to make you sick. That's what he believed. He had no evidence for that, no scripture for that. You know, God never said that to him, but that's what he believed because of tradition and, you know, that kind of idea. So when he recovered, his, his urgent desire was to do God's will. And I guess the motivation was wrong because it was fear-based, but his heart was in the right place because, you know, he just wanted to do God's will. So he turned up at the church and said, when I went and worshipped with you guys, before I got sick, God told me to be a minister. And they said, we know. We know you're called to be a minister. And they ordained him right there and then. And he started traveling around these eternal light churches. There was quite a few of them. And he started traveling and preaching the gospel. He was an evangelist. That's how he started his ministry. And he would preach the gospel and people would get saved. Now, in those days, they did not ever, none of these churches, and it wasn't a common practice in any of the churches, they never raised an offering for a guest speaker. So he just had to trust God to provide. And he used to say, God's my provider. God called me. God will support me. And he learned how to live by faith. And he learned how to pray in faith. And he learned how to believe God to supply his needs according to God's riches in Christ. Which is wonderful. And I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to look up here and see how we're doing. I'm glad you're really blessed by these testimonies. Hallelujah. Awesome. Sounds like tree of life. I tell you what, if we make a, a, a hundredth of the impact of Azusa Street, I will go to heaven happy. My, my, my. So, he's traveling to Texas, and he's doing a, like a preaching circuit, and he's preaching all the churches on the way to Texas, and uh, he's going to finish up at Houston, and then work his way back. So when he gets to Houston, he finds out that he's actually got family in Houston. He didn't know he had family in Houston, so they, they say, you can stay in the house with us, and he says, well, if I can stay in a house for free, this can be the base of my traveling ministry. I'll, I'll, I'll move my ministry here. Now, 1905. There's an evangelist called Charles Parham. Now, Charles Parham is one of the first people. He's been speaking in tongues since 1901. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost in 1901 while teaching at a Bible college. He asked his students to write an essay on what is the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because the Methodists were fighting over that answer. And one of his students wrote an essay saying it's obviously tongues. And he read it, and he'd never thought that before. Nobody had really thought that at the time. And he said, Lord, I want to know more. So at the next day at the Bible college, he asked the student who wrote the essay, do you speak in tongues? And she said, yes, I do. And he said, I want to speak in tongues. And one of his students prayed for him, and he started speaking in tongues. That was in 1901 in Kansas. Now, Parham is an evangelist traveling around. And he, at the same time that Seymour's in Houston, Parham's in Houston. And every evening, after the traffic had died down for the day, Parham would march through the streets with a giant banner and he called his ministry the apostolic faith movement and the, the newspapers loved Parham and wrote really good things about his meetings. Now Parham again very rare in those days he was famous he was a white man but he was famous for these multi-ethnic meetings and some of Seymour's friends were going to Parham's meetings and really being blessed. Now there was a lady called Lucy Farrow Lucy Farrow is really important in the story of Azusa Street, Lucy Farrow. And she was, um, when, he, when Seymour moved his base to Texas, Lucy was the pastor of the church that Seymour used to go to when he wasn't traveling, okay? So Pastor Lucy, she started going to Parham's meetings, and Parham really liked her. Parham's family really liked her, and Parham's children, who used to travel with his children, they really liked her as well. They liked Auntie Lucy as well. So Parham said, for the next two months I want to travel, I want to take my family with me, would you be the nanny to my children? That's what he asked Pastor Lucy uh, for two months. Well, Lucy Farrow was a pastor, but she really loved the evangelist, and she thought not only could she teach the children, but she would learn a lot in two months with this evangelist traveling with him. She thought it would be an honor. So she took up the offer. But if she's going to disappear for two months, how many of you realize the church needs a pastor? So she asked William Seymour, who's an evangelist, full-time evangelist, living by faith, living in her church. She asked him, would you pastor the church for a couple of months while I'm away? And he said, yes, I'll do that for two months. So two months later, Pastor Lucy comes back and she tells Seymour, guess what, Seymour? I'm speaking in tongues now. I speak in tongues just like in Bible days. And Seymour said this to her. It's quite interesting. He said, I do not doubt your testimony. You're my pastor. And you're honest. I don't doubt this is your experience, but I don't 
believe the doctrine. And she said, well, look in the Bible, Seymour. So he went to his Bible, went home, read the Bible, and he found out that the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Bible comes with tongues. They were all filled with the Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues. And what happened with Seymour, and this is very interesting, is he had an intellectual experience. He believed, biblically, that you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you start speaking in tongues. But he didn't get the experience. He never got baptized in the Holy Ghost at that stage and started speaking in tongues. But he started teaching it. He started going around telling people, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. But he didn't have it. And he wasn't. no one was getting it from his meetings. But he was teaching it so strongly that the Evening Light Church basically took his ordination papers away. And said, you can't be a pastor with us if you're teaching this stuff. They unordained him, basically. He left the group over speaking in tongues, and he'd never spoken in tongues. And apart from Pastor Lucy, he didn't know anyone who did speak in tongues. I mean, that's where he was at. This guy was really passionate about speaking in tongues. Awesome. Lucy Farrow, a lady pastor. Absolutely right, Amanda. Pastor Lucy Farrow, an African-American lady pastor. I'm just going to type in her name there. You can have a look. She's quite a woman. And uh, we'll get to her in a minute. She's going she's gonna to be in act two of this story. Okay, so a week later, Parham announces in the newspapers, I'm going to start Bible school in Houston in December. And so Lucy Farrow says to Seymour, you need to be at that Bible school, sir. You need to be there. And she was so passionate. Pastor Lucy was so passionate. Seymour was like, okay, I'm going. And he signed up. Now, Parham used to do this every so often in different towns. And he'd run a three-month Bible school. And what he would do is he would buy or hire a big house. And all the students came and lived in the house like Big Brother. And they all had to adapt to living with each other. That was part of the character building for the three months. And they had church every evening. It went on late at night. And they had classes all day. I mean, these guys just crammed the Word of God into you in three months. You probably got about three years of Bible school in those three months. They just kept throwing the Word at you. And they studied the Word day and night. When they weren't studying the Word, they were praying. Now, there was no tuition fees. Parham didn't charge any tuition fees, but every student had to believe to pay their share of the rent or their share of the, 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 the property, and they had to make sure they believed for their own food and everything. They were, they were believing God for their needs to be met. And Parham saw that as a vital part of their education. Now, because you've got the Jim Crow laws in Texas at the time, there was a big issue with could Seymour stay overnight with the other students? And the answer was he wasn't allowed to. So Parham said, just turn up in the morning and join the class and then go home when the classes are finished in the evening. So he was there and Parham loved Seymour. He really loved him, but he couldn't accept him as a, as a full-time stay-in-the-house student because of the laws at the time. So he was a daytime student in the class. Now, Seymour di disagreed with Parham a lot. And I don't want to get too deep into doctrine this evening. I'm in storytelling mode. But the, the short answer is Seymour, because of his love for Wesley, because of all the Wesley he read, he was very much on the Armenian side of things. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Okay? And then on the other side of things, um, Parham was a bit more of a Calvinist. Okay? And um, he, so there was a split there. And so Seymour didn't agree with a lot of what he was taught at the Bible school. However, Parham was the only person talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, the power of Pentecost is what Parham used to call it. We're now going to teach on the power of Pentecost. And so Seymour's studying those things and he loves it. He absolutely loves that. So, while Pastor Lucy was traveling with Parham, and Seymour was the pastor for two months, eight weeks, there was a lady called Miss Neely. Okay, now Miss Neely went to Houston to visit some friends. She lived in California, and when she turned up at Houston, they took her to church with her, and they took her to the church. And Seymour was the pastor at the time, and she thought he was the best pastor she'd ever seen. She she wrote in her diary he was gentle and secure. And so what happened was, is Seymour's getting to the end of his three months at Bible College, and he thinks, what do I do now? Do, do, where do I go and evangelize? I can't go and evangelize back at my old churches. They've sort of un un ordained me. What do I do with my ministry? What do I do, God? And, uh, you know, it's a good thing to pray that, isn't it? You know, what do I do with the rest of my life, Lord? Well, she's in L.A. And I won't tell you the situation in L.A. just yet. I will get to it in a second. But she wrote him a letter that basically said, I'm part of a church in L.A. We need a pastor. We've just left the Nazarene, which is a Wesleyan denomination, because we want to get involved in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, would you come be our pastor? 
And Seymour's like, hold on, there's a church that want me. They love Wesley, but they want to know more about the baptism of spirit and speaking in tongues. This is the perfect church. So he left. That day, he packed and left. And he went to California. Let me read you Seymour's own notes. I was divinely called from Houston to Los Angeles. The Lord put it on the heart of a precious saint in L.A. to write me that she felt the Lord would have me come there, and I felt it was the leading of the Lord. The Lord provided the money, and I came to take charge of a church on Santa Fe Street. Now, 1905-1906, L.A., people, there's a real hunger for God in California back then. People wanted church to change. They wanted to encounter the Lord. There was lots and lots of evangelists were coming to California. There was people knocking on doors. There were ministries that were doing street preaching. There was a lot of evangelism going on. Churches were praying. And in 1906, L.A. was possibly, if not the, one of the most multicultural cities in the world. There's a lot of black people in L.A. in 1906. A lot of Chinese people. There's a lot of Hispanic people. But they all worshipped in separate churches. And what happened as well is a few of the pastors from California had gone to Wales, 1904, 1905. Why? To be part of the Welsh Revival. And so they had this big vision because they'd just seen all these dozens and hundreds of people getting saved in Wales. And they wanted that to happen in California. And uh, one of the evangelists, traveling evangelists based in L.A., was a man called Frank Bartleyman. And Frank Bartleyman and Seymour became very close friends. And Frank Bartleyman was a big part of the Azusa Street Revival as well. And Frank Bartleyman had a dream one night that people were coming from all over the world to L.A., and so he wrote to Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was the guy behind the Welsh Revival in 1904. And he wrote a letter to Evan Roberts and said, Would you pray for California? I would like everyone in Wales to pray for California. And Evan Roberts wrote back. And Evan Roberts wrote back and said, Dear Mr. Bartleman, dear Pastor Bartleman, I am standing with you, and I believe God will hear your prayer, and I believe that God will keep your faith strong, and I believe God will save California. And Frank Bartleman said, I've never seen this before, but it was like faith came off the letter and came through the letter and made me believe something remarkable was going to happen in California. And he later said that the prayers in Wales started the Azusa Street Revival. He said the Pentecostal Revival was rocked in the cradle of the tiny nation of Wales. That's how he said it. That's his words. Now in L.A., there was a group of black Christians getting together to pray from several different black churches. Most of them had come from one church. And the leader of that prayer meeting was Sister Julia Hutchinson. Sorry if I'm throwing a lot of names at you. Um, I, I spent all week studying this. I came to Amanda at the beginning of the week and I said, I don't know who to do for this Champions of the Faith series. And I gave Amanda three or four options and she jumped on William Seymour. I said, why is that, darling? She said, I know the least about him. I'd love to hear you tell me some stories. So that's why I chose him. And I just want to bless Amanda with this and bless you guys with it. But um, I, I, I stayed up one night just reading stories about him. There's so much I've edited out of this. Man, you need to study his life. You need to read some of his own books. He's got books of sermons on Kindle, things like that. And so there's this group of black Christians from different churches. The leader was a lady called Sister Julia Hutchinson. And because they were from different churches, they decided, let's not have anyone preach because we'll upset the other Christians from the other churches. So they just got together and sang praises and worshipped. Now, she got kicked out of her church for teaching John Wesley's doctrines. That's why they kicked her out, teaching John Wesley's doctrines, those controversial Methodists, those wild, crazy Methodists. And she had a real passion to see Christians grow and be discipled and develop. And what they basically did was there was quite a few people from her church going to these meetings and so they kicked them all out of the church at once. So now you basically had a church split because they all got kicked out of the church. And they wanted to start a church. And so they didn't know a pastor. And they wanted a pastor. And Sister Julia didn't feel like she was a pastor. So this was the group that um, Nelly was part of, Miss Nelly. And so that's the group that wrote to Seymour. So it wasn't quite a church. It was basically a group of Christians that had been kicked out of their church for wanting to grow as Christians. And uh, they had a vote on it. And it was unanimous. They all wanted Seymour as their pastor. So he turns up in this city. I'm trying to set this scene. People are expecting revival. People have been to the Welsh revival. People are talking about something big happening. People, have, one of the big pastors uh, has had a dream. One of the evangelists had a dream. And he's excited. He's excited to be there. And the church assembled. And um, it was a big meeting. People had really bigged up this young evangelist turned pastor. And loads of people had come out to hear him. 
Well, he preached all his material in one message. And I know some of you sort of, not necessarily younger people, but younger ministers, younger in preaching, um, have done this. I know you've done this. You just preached everything. I know if Adam's watching this, I know he's done this. He just preached everything. And so he preached salvation. He preached um, on the return of Jesus. He preached divine healing. And then he preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he told the church, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not full of the Holy Ghost. You're not baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then he told them, he said, I'm not baptized in the Holy Ghost. I don't speak in tongues. But it's the truth. And I'm going to preach the truth. Whether I see it, whether I manifest it, it's the truth of the word. And I'm going to preach the word. And he preached the whole, every sermon he had. He preached on holiness. He preached on healings for everyone. I mean, he just covered every single thing. Well, he ended his message with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that was too much for this new church. They didn't like it. Some agreed with him. Others were yelling him. They got up and yelled at him and walked out while he was preaching. So there was a family that had already invited him for dinner after he finished preaching. And so they invite him over for dinner. And then after dinner, they take him back to the church to go to the evening service. And Sister Julia has locked the building, padlocked the building, and closed the church. And she told everyone, Seymour's crazy. He's an extremist. I don't want anything to do with his baptism and Holy Spirit teaching. And Seymour's stuff was on the church. And he had a bedroom in the church. So he was denied access to his own bedroom and his own stuff. He didn't have any money on him. And he had nowhere to sleep. Well, the family that invited him for dinner, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, they'd given him a lift to the church. And they took him home and let him sleep. They, they weren't happy with it. But what else are they going to do? They can't just turn this guy out on the street. They weren't keen to. Seymour goes into the room they set aside for him in the guest room and he locks himself out in the room and doesn't come out for seven days. He spends seven days fasting and praying, oh God, what am I going to do in my life? And then after seven days, he comes out and he sits down with Mr. and Mrs. Lee and he says, guys, I'm sure he didn't say guys, excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, um, is it possible to pray with me? Can we pray together? And they said, yes. And as they started to pray with him, God really softened their hearts to him because one of the things about William Seymour is when he prayed, people said it was the most beautiful thing listening to him pray. That people just stopped what they were doing and listened to him pray. And other people from the church heard that these prayer meetings were like off the scale amazing. And so people start coming. The church is not meeting anymore, but people are coming to the Lee's house and they're joining in with these prayer meetings every night. And William Seymour was just praying. And they called him the prayer man. That's what they called him, the prayer man. When he was a teenager, they called him the Bible man. When he was a young adult, they called him the prayer man. Now, that's just remarkable. That's a lot nicer than what they call me sometimes. Now, Sister Julia, she finds out the whole church is pretty much is now going to the Lee's house and praying with Seymour. So she's not happy. So the church was part of the Holiness Church. So she contacts the leaders of the Holiness Church denomination and says, this man's in error. You need to stop him having meetings. That's what she does. She's trying to stir things up there. Awesome. How are we all doing? Praise God. Come on, Wales. <laughs> the Welsh are going crazy over the Welsh revival being mentioned. Hi, Audrey and Laura. Hi, Tina. Hi, the shepherds. Hi, Rich and Jackie. I'm really glad this is blessing people. Patience. I've done similar. Locked a church building and not let people in. Patience. What has patience done that's similar to what I've said, everyone? Uh, that would be an interesting question. Um, Laura, Tina, hello. Mr. and Mrs. Lee, that's right. Awesome, isn't it, Gary and Michelle? And uh, Lee's here as well. Mr. Lee and Gary Lee and Michelle Lee. The, all the Lees are here tonight. And Mr. and Mrs. Lee are having these prayer meetings in their house. Now, what happens is these group of pastors from the Holiness Church, these experienced, mature pastors... They get Lee, uh, not Lee, they get Mr. Seymour, William Seymour, to sit in front of them and they start to interrogate him. And he just gets his Bible out and starts reading scriptures to them. And he reads Acts 2 verse 2 and they all got filled with the Spirit and they all spoke in tongues. And he said, if we don't speak in tongues, we're not full of the Spirit. He said, none of you have a problem with me, you have a problem with the Bible. Now that sounds quite bold, doesn't it? And in case you think he was a bit aggressive and rude, a bit like me sometimes... Um, that's not the case. In fact, this letter from one of those ministers who was in that panel. We were contentious, but he was not contentious. I never met a man with such control over his spirit. He was never confused, never disturbed, even under the worst of accusations. He sat and smiled at us so sweetly, we just felt condemned by arguing with him. He was calm. He was um, very peaceful as a person. 
He was, he was a very easy leader, a very gifted leader, and it was obvious to everyone. Following that investigation, he was asked to leave the Lee's house, but another family, the Asbury's, they said, come live in our house, let's just have church. We don't need a denomination, let's just have church. And in February 1906, they started a church, and most of their meetings were just prayer meetings, and most of their prayer meetings were basically this. Oh God, we really need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. Oh God, can you please give us a baptism in the Holy Spirit? Oh Jesus, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they're praying and praying and praying. They didn't know they could just believe and receive. They knew it was in the Bible. They knew they wanted it, but they didn't know how to get it. I, I love reading some of these books because they're so earnest, these people, that they're just so hungry for the things of God. I, I think if I'd lived back then and had that kind of ignorance, I'd have given up after a day. Okay, I can't get it. Oh, well, bye. Moving on. You know, but these guys were persistent. They were faithful. They were, it's not like they were digging up their back garden with a spoon because they knew there was some gold in it somewhere. You know, it, they're just wonderful. It's just wonderful to read these things. And, I, you know, I read that when I read John G. Lake. He didn't know what we knew today. He, he can go and read his Smith Wigglesworth books and his Hagen books and his Copeland books and his Andrew Warmack books. You know, they just dug around in the Bible and found these things. And um, so because it wasn't happening... Seymour made a decision. He contacted his old friend and pastor, Pastor Lucy Farrow. And he told the whole church, he said, Lucy is a great pastor. She talks in tongues. She's a great teacher. She's awesome. And so they took up an offering so they could pay for Pastor Lucy to come from Houston to LA and teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is where it all kicks off, and it's awesome. And I want you to get a couple of points out of this before we go any further. Number one, a revival can begin in someone's house. The smallest of beginnings can rock the world. Never despise the day of small beginnings. Never, ever despise the day of small beginnings. Awesome. What's happening up here? He preached everything. I preached my heart and threw everything out. That's what I've done. I got your patience. Yeah, he preached all the messages at once. We've all done it. Awesome. We need an assembling of Lees. The Council of Lees. Man, that'd be awesome. Uh, no, I wouldn't, Ben. What wouldn't I do? Because of the time delay, I'm not quite sure what I wouldn't do there. I wouldn't have given up. That's very sweet, darling. Thank you. Everything can begin in the house. Never despise small beginnings. And some of you, you know, even Dagenham small compared to the vision I've got in my heart. But some of you in some of the satellite churches and grace gatherings, you know, don't despise the day of small beginnings. God, can, oh, just, just look what God can do for a house prayer meeting. And another point, another thing I want you to get, never be afraid to get help if you're believing God for something that's not happening. You know, since last July, since July 2019, God's been speaking to me. I want a deeper flow of the Holy Ghost in your meetings, Ben. I want a deeper flow of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, I was asking God and I was praying to God. And then last October, the year last October, I heard Greg Moore preach on the flow of the Holy Ghost in America at a pastor's conference, and my goodness, it was the most powerful meeting in that pastor's conference, and there was a beautiful flow of the Holy Ghost, and I knew, you know, if I'm going to see a deeper flow of the Holy Ghost in Tree of Life, I want to get Greg Moore to come and help us get that deeper flow of the Holy Ghost, and that's why we did the conference in February. You know, never have an ego as a pastor. If you need to get specialists in, if you need to get other people in, never have an ego. Be humble and get them in. If you're struggling to get healed, listen to me, Christian. Get that, that person involved. Call the elders of the church. Text them, video call them, Skype them, and get help. Get other people involved who know what they're doing if you're struggling. Don't be so, I'm going to get this on my own. You don't have to. We're the body of Jesus Christ. We're there for one another. And that's what God's done for us. And so Pastor Lucy turns up and Seymour says, we're going to fast 10 days. No food until we all get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so day four of the fast, Seymour gets a contact from Mr. Lee. That's from the first house. Mr. Lee, we all know who Mr. Lee is now because we're all talking about the Lees. Awesome. And so... Uh, he calls Seymour, he says, will you come pray for me? I'm sick. So Seymour turns up with his anointing oil, and he prays for Mr. Lee, and Mr. Lee is instantly healed. Seymour's never seen a healing before. He's preached healing, but he's never seen one. And he sees Mr. Lee get healed, and then Mr. Lee gets out of his sick bed and says, today I'm going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Seymour lays hands on him, and Mr. Lee starts speaking in tongues. Well, the two of them start praising God together. Seymour's still not speaking in tongues. And they rejoice all day, and they spend so long praising God from the morning. It's now time for the evening meeting. So they walk together, Mr. Lee and Mr. Seymour, to the Ashby's house to go to church, to go to the evening prayer meeting. 
So they get to the Asprey's house. Every room is packed. I mean, the whole place is packed because everyone wants to hear Pastor Lucy. Some of the rooms are praying and it's a bit chaotic because some rooms are doing this and some rooms are doing that. So Seymour takes over and starts saying, right, we're all going to flow together here. If we're going to get from God, we need to flow together. That's a great principle. And so he starts leading them in worship. And this was one of William Seymour's gifts. He could lead worship. He couldn't lead singing very well. He wasn't musically minded, but he could lead worship. He said, right, we're going to sing this song now. And everyone would start singing. And uh, he'd stop after every song to get a testimony. And there was a pianist playing at that stage. And then he'd lead them in prayer. And so after three or four songs, he says, I want to tell you a story. And he starts telling the story about what happened to him that morning, that Mr. Lee got healed and Mr. Lee got baptized in the Holy Ghost. When he starts telling the story, Mr. Lee falls off his chair onto his knees, raises his hands and starts speaking in tongues. Well, suddenly all over the whole house, people start falling on their knees and start praying and start speaking in tongues. Now, one of the ladies who got baptized, in fact, the first one to fall on her knees and start speaking in tongues was the pianist. Her name was Jenny Moore, and she later became Jenny Seymour. She went from Jenny Moore to Jenny Seymour because she married William Seymour. And she was playing the piano as Seymour was leading worship, and now she's on her knees praying in tongues. And as people start moving from tongues to prophecy and they start to be prophesied, I don't other people. Others start speaking in tongues. They get up. They leave the house. They start knocking on the neighbors' doors and start praying for them. Jenny Moore sits up back at the piano. She sings six different songs in six different tongue languages and then sings the interpretation of all six songs while praying. And the meeting went on for hours. Everyone got filled with the Spirit. People are full of joy. People are full of grace. Well, except for William Seymour, who's still not speaking in tongues. Now, for three days, they had meetings like that. They went on for hours, and they just praised God. William Seymour called it early Pentecost restored meetings. Early Pentecost restored meetings. You can tell that he's African-American, can't you? We're going to go to the early Pentecost restored meetings. And the news of these meetings started to spread everywhere. And suddenly the house is so full. There's crowds of people coming, so they have to start meeting in the backyard. And now they're filling the garden, and there's white people there now. There's Chinese people there. There's Hispanics there. People would sit outside the windows just to try and get a glimpse of someone speaking in tongues. Everyone was talking about these meetings. And the meetings were all very different. Sometimes they were loud, and people would yell and shout in tongues and praise. And other times they were very quiet, and there'd be a gentle flow. People would just fall out, fall on their knees, fall on their backs, fall under the Spirit. People would lay praying in tongues on the floor for two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. And then uh, in the third meeting, fourth meeting, people start getting healed. Let me read a testimony of someone who was in those meetings. I'm glad this is exciting. Praise God. Mel, Ben and Amanda are so sweet to each other. I wish that was true 100% of the time. Um, I'm not always. I I, I do try sometimes. Awesome. Uh, We are small but powerful in Watford. Looking forward to growth. Amen. Go Watford. Hey, patience just said go Watford. Tree of life is on the increase. Amen. Same with Dorset. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Hello. Watching. Praise God. Can't wait to be together again. I agree. Whoever Ara is, I agree. Can't wait. Is it Arasha? Hey, Arasha. Absolutely. I want to come to Watford when you start meeting again. I want to be there. Okay. So they had these meetings. This is the written testimony. The noise of the great outpouring of the Spirit drew me. I'd been nothing but a walking drugstore my whole life. My lungs were weak and I had cancer. As they looked at me in the meeting, they said, Child, God will heal you. In those days of outpouring, when they said God would heal you, you were healed. For 33 years now, since those days, I've never seen a doctor. I want to thank God, and I've never taken medicine. The Lord saved me, baptized me in the Holy Ghost, healed me, and I left that house rejoicing. At the Asprey's front porch was the pulpit. And the street was the pews as the meeting spilled out of the house, out of the backyard and onto the street. Seymour would preach from the house. One day, the front porch collapsed. There were so many people on it. It had to be rebuilt and rebuilt with reinforced stuff so they could keep the whole meetings going. Now, night number three of these meetings. That's when Seymour received the Holy Spirit, April 12, 1906. Most people had gone home. The meeting was finished. And uh, Seymour knelt down. And he just was on his knees, hands up, and just said, thank you, God, for a beautiful meeting. I understand that, you know. 
I have meetings like that. I just want to just kneel. Thank you, God. This meeting was beautiful. Thank you, Jesus, for the worship. Thank you. Uh, it was like Tia's uh, uh, thing on the WhatsApp today. Thank you for the ushers. Thank you for Chris and Vaughn. Thank you for all the people. You know, and as he as he's just on his knees thanking God, a man comes to him, kneels down next to him, and says, "Would you pray for me, Brother Seymour? I, I want to speak in tongues." And Seymour laid hands on him, and as he started praying for him, Seymour started praying in tongues. The man started praying in tongues. And they both started worshiping God in tongues together. He'd prayed for dozens before that day, but now he started speaking in tongues. And again, that's a principle we can all learn from. Preach healing while you're still sick. Preach prosperity while you're still broke. The promises of God are true. Your experience is a liar. God's word is true. Preach the truth to people. You know, I mean, be authentic and, you know, you want to get some meat on the bones. But we, we, we don't preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not for today just because you haven't got it. When you preach it, John Wesley used to say, preach faith until you've got faith. Now, they needed a new venue because the crowds were just too big for the house. He was preaching to the streets. So they, they, they went on a prayer walk around the city. They started wandering around praying. They came to this dead-end street, an industrial estate. In the middle of it was a burnt-out Methodist church, which was now being used as a stable. Well, Seymour bought the building. The windows were all smashed. There was light bulbs hanging off the ceiling. There was loose wires. But all they wanted was $8 a month to buy it. Um, I did the math, just about $300 a month in today's money. So it's not, not expensive. And people came from all over to get the building ready. I mean, how that building got ready for church is a miracle in itself. The full gospel church, the full gospel church paid workers to renovate the place. The full gospel church paid, paid workers to renovate the place. Volunteers came in and swept all the floors clean, painted the walls. There was a guy called J.V. McNeil. He was a born-again Catholic, and he owned the largest lumber company in L.A. And he turned around to Seymour and said, You can have all the lumber you want for free. Have it all. Take whatever you want. Any wood you need, have it. And uh, someone else gave them free barrels as well. So they got the barrels and used the barrels as seats. And what they did was Seymour said, No stage. I want to be at the same level as the people. And you've got to realize that did not happen in American churches in 1906. You had a stage. You had an elevated ministry. No, Seymour said, I'm coming down to the people's level. And he said, put the bow all around the room. So I'm in the middle and everyone has to look at other Christians while I preach. And so that's what he did. And everyone sat in a barrel. And he said, everyone sits on the same seats. There's no special seats for anyone. We're all the same. And there was no stage. Everyone's at the same level. It was very informal. There was never an announcement of the guest speaker. If someone's a guest speaker, it was never announced, never let to known. They just get up and speak. The music had no instruments. Uh, Seymour went back at that stage to his sort of um, eternal light state. There was no instruments, no songbooks, no PowerPoint, I guess, no OHPs. Some of the younger people going, what's an OHP? Ask your mom, ask your nan. But they had speakers would come from all nationalities, male and female. And uh, they had a lot of female preachers at Azusa Street, actually. And they'd just come preach and they'd give altar calls. And Seymour didn't believe in prayer ministry. Right, guys. Refresh, because I am here. Hallelujah. Sorted. Sorted. I'm back. Are you back with me? Are you all back with me? We're talking about this church where they had sawdust for the floors. We're talking about the church where they were sitting on barrels for hours on end. That cannot have been comfortable. They did not get cinema seats or four-star hotel seats. They were sitting on barrels, man. Awesome. Let me know you're back on, please. Speak to me. Chat with me. Let me know you're still here. Praise God. Man, I think there's more people here. There's more people joined. That's what happened off air. Maybe they thought it was better with me off air. I don't know. Awesome. Praise God. Nobody is saying they've got me back yet. Um, I guess that's because we're still just refreshing a little bit, but um, that, that time delay should have passed by now. Praise God. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Praise God. Okay. I'm just waiting for you guys to tell me I'm here and chatting away, and then I'll start joining in. Seymour did not like, he didn't like prayer. He disagreed with prayer ministry. Like, I'll lay hands on you and I'll pray for you. He wasn't a big fan of that. So when you came forward an altar call, you just got on your knees and you prayed. If you needed healing, you got on your knees and you got your healing. If you needed baptism of the Holy Ghost, you got on your knees and got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you needed salvation, you got on your knees and you prayed and you got saved. And so he, he was a big believer. You do it yourself. You pray for it yourself and you believe for it yourself. That's what he believed. Um, where are you guys? 
Where are you all hiding? No one has typed anything in. I do hope you're watching. Okay. So I'm just going to keep going and hopefully someone will say, Ben, you're on, I'm watching you. And you look gorgeous. Um, so he didn't do that. So and there would be a beautiful flow of the spirit in these meetings. He'd give a tongues message. There'd be an interpretation. Some of these services lasted 12 hours long. Some of them kind of went on two or three days. People kind of go and come and really it never ended. They just kind of just kept going. And uh, there was a supernatural life to these things. And uh, people would go home early morning and then meet at streetlights and just pray for one another and keep going. And uh, what would happen as well is uh, William Seymour loved having guest speakers because they were meeting every night, ministering every night. And he loved having guest speakers. And I'm still speaking and I can see I'm on, but no one's clicking the button. Okay, press play, people. Press play. Hello. Anyone here? McFly. Hello, 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 hello. Praise God. Awesome. So, um, where were we? Yes. So, if someone gets up to preach, right, and um, they missed it, they weren't kind of anointed, they were trying to be over intellectual, they were trying to be smart about things, trying to let me impress you with my sermon. Well, the people would start yelling at you, they would start shouting you down, they would shut you down, and you have to go and get another preacher. Oh, praise God. Lee's just told me you can see me. Praise God. Okay. And so... We can hear you, Dad. Okay, cool. Joel's just come downstairs and told me too. Um, awesome. So, where was I? That's right. Yeah, if you preached and you were over-intellectual and you were not feeding them, they would shout you down. So there's one time a young man gets up to preach and he's being a bit cocky with it all and he wasn't preaching the word. And so an old lady gets up, sits at his feet and says, You need to know, son. You're not called to preach, and you're not anointed to preach. And he ran out the pulpit and ran out the building. And from then on, if Mother Jones stood to her feet while you were preaching, the preacher would move. He'd get out of there. And so, I mean, that's hilarious. I think that's hilarious. Um, and what I'm really, again, amazing to me, as someone who pastors in London and pastors, you know, 30, 40 nationalities, is, is the remarkable multi-ethnic mix within Azusa Street. Bartleman wrote this. Okay. Many were curious. They came unbelieving and they came to see. Others came hungry and wanted to meet God. The newspapers hated the meeting. The newspapers hated the meetings, but they were just free advertising to us. And the newspapers brought the biggest crowds. We knew that when the newspaper wrote a hate story, we were going to get the biggest crowds. The devil always outdid himself. And outside persecution always made our work better. I mean, that's powerful. He then wrote this. What we had to fear were the demons inside the church. We had spiritualists and hypnotists come and pretend to be part of us. We've had that a couple of times at Tree of Life. Spiritualists come to the church and pretend to be Christian. We've had crooks and cranks and religious nutcases with sore heads trying to take over the work. I mean, that still happens today. This danger, this is what Frank Bartleman said, this danger is present in every work. They had no place elsewhere, and sadly, they scared people. People were scared in the early days to seek God, because they were scared. They got the, oh, look, I can see all everyone's, everyone's typing just come up at once now. Joel went on, please tell Ben one, blah, blah, blah. Awesome, praise God, awesome. Back to Frank Bartleman. Sorry about this, I'm, I'm getting distracted. They had no place elsewhere, and people got scared. People were scared to seek God in the early days because they were scared they'd get the devil. And we found this, and this is some great wisdom for every pastor and leader and elder listening, any Christian. When we tried to study, steady the ark, nothing moved. If we told people, beware of Satan, and focused on Satan, people got scared. So we preached about God being the victor, and we depended on Christ, and that's how the work survived. And you've got to understand as well, the, the criticism on Seymour was, was, was absolutely supernatural. He was, people hated him. As, as many people as loved him, people hated him. And he was a very humble man. You read his encounters with other people, you read about the people who met him. He was gracious, he was kind, he was very yielded to the Lord. Now, I mean, he's been pastoring less than a year, and suddenly he's pastoring the largest revival in the world. So th there was definitely inexperience there. Uh, you know, you, you want someone with a bit more experience. But, and, and I, I do seem to think, based on what I've read, that he did focus on Satan a bit too much early on, 
but he learned to focus back on the Lord. I mean, he was a young Christian. And Frank Bartleman said when he found his voice, his voice had an amazing strength to turn people to Jesus. They had meetings day and night, and Seymour's favorite sermon was the blood of Jesus. He reworked some of Wesley's sermons on holiness, and he preached on the love of God so much, and he would never allow you to say unkind words about someone else in his presence. That's powerful. And he would never let anyone be specially treated. The poorest and richest sat on the same barrels, and everybody prayed on their knees on the same sawdust. Bartleman said, I'd rather live six months being part of Seymour's church and listening to Seymour preach than 50 years of life. People got saved and healed walking into the building. People started speaking in tongues. No one ever prayed with them. By summer of 1906, just weeks later, there were thousands in every single service. Every day, people getting off the trains, full of people coming to Azusa Street. All over America, international visitors, news reports going all over America, all international. And, and Seymour had another real strength. Remember when he needed to get people baptized in the Holy Ghost and he called Pastor Lucy? He, he called a lot of Methodist ministers to him that he knew were spiritual. He called missionaries because he knew missionaries could deal with different cultures. And all these different cultures are together. So he got missionaries to come from overseas and, and start ministering. And because many of them were missionaries, guess what they preached on? What do missionaries love to preach on? World mission. And so now, because of that, people who were baptized in the Holy Ghost started going from Azusa Street. They went to Scandinavia. They went to China. They went to India. They went to Egypt, started churches in Ireland. All over the world, people are now going as missionaries baptized in the Holy Ghost. Do you remember Sister Julia? The one who locked Seymour out of the church in the first place when he first came to L.A.? She came to Azusa Street joined the thousand worshipping, knelt down at the altar call, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and went off to Africa and started churches in Africa. Do you know Amy Semple McPherson? Some of you will have heard of her. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit in Azusa Street with her husband, Robert. They got baptized in the Holy Ghost in Azusa Street in a William Seymour meeting. I mean, things were happening. Lives were getting changed. Things were just going out there. Now, they made some mistakes. There's, there's mistakes that... I look back at with my hindsight, and I think are quite funny, but at the time they must have been quite difficult. Some people thought that when you spoke in tongues, and again, I can't see anywhere where Seymour preached this at all. I don't believe he taught it himself. I can't see any evidence of that. But some people thought when I get the gift of tongues, and I start speaking in tongues, that's the nation I'm supposed to go and preach to and go and live there and go and be a missionary there. And so some people started traveling all around Africa, trying to find the tribe that matched their tongue. And man, they got into trouble because they weren't called to Africa. They were supposed to speak in tongues and build themselves up. There wasn't that much good teaching on the purpose of tongues because nobody had really started expounding things like 1 Corinthians yet. But Seymour was, although there was this hatred within the church, man, they loved him. And when the spirit was moving, he'd kneel down and hide behind the pulpit and just pray. He didn't want anyone to look at him. He never took an offering. There was never an offering taken at Azusa Street. And so the only way to get money to him, people wanted him to have money, was to sneak it in his pocket when he was lost in worship or prayer. So he would kneel down to pray, and he'd pray for an hour or two, and when he'd get up, there'd be 5 and $10 bills sticking out of every pocket. And honestly, I could be here till midnight talking about the miracles. John G. Lake went to Azusa Street. This is what he said. Seymour had a wonderful vocabulary, and a very funny accent. You know, that's way, way of saying he didn't understand this sort of, um, you know, the, the, this black man from Louisiana. But I want to tell you, this is John G. Lake. There were doctors, lawyers, and professors from universities sitting down on those barrels, listening to the wisdom pouring from his lips. And it was more than his words. He spoke with his spirit. He showed me more of the life of God than any other man I've ever met. That's what John G. Lake said about William Seymour. People came from all over the world. Rabbis would come. Trains of rabbis would come. And they would sit and listen to William Seymour preach. The magazines just crossed the world. He used to write this monthly magazine. He was posting out 50,000 magazines a month and sending them around the world. Again, I could go on all night. You could go and do some research of your own. And I'll tell you, you'll be really blessed. It's easier to find a bit of stuff on Frank Bartleman. He seems to be a bit more of a more organized ministry. But it was Seymour I really wanted to talk about. I, it's just his heart, the way he handled things, the way his life experiences. So I'm going to close with a sermon. Seymour said, so close with a sermon, I'm going to close with a story. 
Seymour said the greatest miracle he ever saw was true love and unity among different races and different creeds. But there were, there were lots of healings and miracles happening in, in Azusa Street. Lots and lots of healings and miracles. Seymour would often get up and he'd go, sing this song. And he'd name the song and everyone would sing it. And then he'd go, sing this song. They'd all go up and sing it. Sing this song. They'd go and, sing it. and then after three or four songs, he'd always go, sing in the spirit. And everyone would start singing in tongues. And again, people used to say it was like being in heaven. Now, there was a young preacher called Brother Signs, S-I-N-E-S, Brother Signs. And he used to go to the Seymour meetings. And he said the best thing about those meetings was how exciting they were. You, anything could happen. Who was going to be healed today? Who was going to speak in tongues today? And Seymour recognized signs, was a preacher, recognized had a call from God. And so he would get signs up often to speak and minister. And what he found out as they built a friendship was that signs was a very gifted pianist. And he used to play the, the, the piano in a couple of other Pentecostal, sort of black Pentecostal churches. And so Signs was 26 in 1906. As a very old man, Signs would tell stories of Azusa Street to his carers. He had carers when he was an elderly man, and he would tell, I mean, this isn't that long ago, we're talking about the 1970s here, 1960s and 70s, and he would tell stories of Azusa Street to his carers, and one of the carers wrote some of them down. This is where I've got this story from. This story has come from one of Signs' carers. So Signs was one of the preachers, he was a friend of Seymour's, and as an old man, he had carers helping him, and he told these stories to his carers. Seymour, Seymour would let Signs play the piano, and he'd say, Signs, play this hymn. He wouldn't tell the whole everyone, he'd just, Signs, play this hymn, and he'd start playing, and the crowd would start singing the song. Signs said this, Seymour always chose the right song, and Signs would play from memory, he couldn't read music, and he'd just play by here, and Signs said, my favorite bit was singing in the spirit. And I would play, and I could almost hear the angels singing as everyone sang. And someone once asked, one of the signs as carers asked him, he said, what's the best miracle, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen? And he said, it was actually a double miracle. This is a double miracle from Azusa Street. This is signs as an old man telling his carer. He said, I was playing the piano. Everyone was singing in the spirit, and Seymour was praying behind his pulpit. There was a little boy on the front row, sitting on a chair, a barrel, not a chair, sitting on a barrel on the front row, and the boy had crutches, just a young, young boy. And Signs comes off the platform, because he just felt drawn to this boy. So everyone's still singing in the spirit, guy, guy playing the piano, stops playing the piano, and walks towards one of the kids sitting on the barrel. And the boy says, why is no one praying for me? I want someone to pray for me. And Signs says, we don't pray for people in this church. You just kneel down and believe God. And the boy said, well, I do believe God. I believe God's going to heal me. So Sign took the crutches off him and took them away from him. And the boy exclaimed, he looked at Signs, and Signs took the crutches. The boy went, I can feel it. I can feel it. And the boy leapt off the barrel and starts dancing in time to the singing in the spirit and starts running around the room. And the boy's completely healed. Crippled boy, couldn't walk without crutches, completely healed. Just because someone took the crutches away. No one prayed for him. No one ministered to him. Just the whole church was singing in the spirit. And I believe that's going to be one of the hallmarks of what we're going to see in Tree of Life going forward. Is there going to be worship sessions where the cripples are going to walk, blind eyes are going to open, deaf ears are going to open, cancers are going to dissolve, tumors are going to fall off people. And as that happened, as, as that boy starts running around, a very old man in his 70s hobbles up to signs, can barely walk. And he calls the worship leader over and Signs remembers, he said, no one called me by my first name. Everybody called me Brother Signs. But this man called me by my first name, he went, Charles. And I turned around and looked at this old man. He said, Charles, my arthritis is crippling me. And he held out his hands to Brother Signs and his hands were all twisted and they were swollen to twice their normal size and they just looked like they couldn't move. And Signs just felt led of the Lord to ask what, what seems like a very strange question. He says, what job did you do when you were a younger man? I mean, the guy was, you know, a long time past retirement age. And the man turned to him and said, I used to lead worship at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Now, Hollywood Presbyterian Church at that time, I mean, we're talking Hollywood, start Hollywood, 7,000 people. That's where all the celebrities would go to church. Um, Roy Rogers went to Hollywood Presbyterian Church, if that name means anything to anyone. And he says, I want to play the piano again. So Sign says, go play the piano then. The man goes, what? And so Signs leads him over to the piano and sits him down on the barrel by the piano and puts his hands on the piano. And the man's looking a bit confused. And Signs says, in Jesus' name, play the piano. 
and the man starts to play, and as he starts playing the piano, the swelling on his hands goes down, and the hands all straighten out, and the bones start to pop, and everything starts to move into place, and the man starts playing, everyone's singing in the spirit. At the end of that service, the man went back to the Presbyterian church, they said, we've never had a worship leader as good as you, and they hire him again, even in his old age, and he goes back to leading worship at the Presbyterian church. Signs said this once, he said, I could do nothing before I met William Seymour. And again, oh, there's so much we could go into, but I want to tell you, Seymour's biggest legacy wasn't the Azusa Street revival as, as, as a revival, as meetings, as these meetings of thousands, though they were powerful and you know changed lives. But he, he invested in so many younger men and younger women and taught them and showed them how to flow in the power of God. And he really, that was his real legacy, was people like Brother Signs. And again, for, brother, for every one of those, I could tell you, you know, so many stories. I was up till nearly four in the morning one of the nights last week just reading these stories. And, and again, I don't want to keep you guys for ages and ages, but I'll tell you what, just just beautiful. And I really believe that, you know, if, if you're in ministry in any form, or even if you're not, your biggest legacy will not be your success. It will be your successor or your successors. And I'll just call you all today just to take that page out of William Seymour's book and, and really invest in people. Invest in others. Help other people learn how to flow. Help other people learn how to do what God's called them to do. Awesome. Praise God. Man, there's some beautiful stuff going on here. Awesome. Praise God. I tell you what, I just want to start singing in the Spirit for a little bit. And you guys, wherever you are, okay, Chris and Vaughn said it was strange this morning, you know, not making that connection. And uh, I understand that right now because I, I want you guys to be joining in and singing louder than me because singing's not my thing. But let's just start singing in the spirit wherever you are. Sheila la Sheila la 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 Just start giving glory to God. If you've never spoken in tongues before, why don't you get on your knees right now? Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need someone to lay hands on you. Just start believing that the Holy Spirit's going to fill you and just start giving, speaking those words out as the Spirit gives you utterance and just start singing with us. Sheila la mo Sheila la la mo con ba 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 de. Oh la 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 la. Sheila la ma don do 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 kin da da de. Ila la la ma na 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 niseke. Jesus, we give you glory this evening. Jesus, we give you praise today. Thank you, Lord. You're knitting us together, Lord. You're leading us to be more like you in every way. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and your kindness. I really sense the Lord is saying to you tonight, everyone who hears the voice, of my, the sound of my voice right now, God is saying to you, I am walking on the water with you. Get out of the boat of doing it your way. Get out of the boat of doing it the world's way, of doing it the way of the natural, and come and walk with me. And I will not let you sink I will not let you down. I will not let you drown. And I'm going to hold your hand. And we're going to walk on the water together. Holding hands in unity. And we're going to do everything I've said for you to do. And we're going to do everything I've called you to do. And you're going to walk in everything that I've promised you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I hope that that message has helped you even as half as much as it helped me to prepare it. And uh, we'll come at you next week. I'm not convinced the lockdown will be over next week. Um, so, you know, if it is, we will keep you posted. Go to tree.church slash new. Join our email list. That's the best way to get posted. I'm sending out emails every day. Tomorrow is the last email on Philippians. Can you believe that in the last three weeks we've been in lockdown? We've gone through the whole book of Philippians verse by verse. And so tomorrow is that last email on Philippians. I'm going to literally get off here and write it now. And then starting Tuesday... It's going to start a brand new series called Bible Predictions. Do you know the Bible predicts a whole bunch of stuff about the future? And it's got some awesome stuff and it's going to be wonderful. And so I want you, 
I want you to know what the Bible predicts. Some of the predictions have happened. I'll show you how they've happened. It'll help increase your faith in the Bible. And some of the predictions haven't happened yet. And you're going to get excited because you're going to start knowing the future. And that's going to be awesome. Okay, there's 74 connections right now. Um, I am doing a special uh, super duper living church meeting tomorrow night, Easter Monday, with Greg Moore at 8 p.m. It's going to be on Zoom. And so if you're in the I Love the Tree or you're in any of the Tree of Life Church WhatsApp groups, I will give you the link. And you'll get the link tomorrow. So if you're in those groups, don't ask me for the link. If you're not in those groups and you want to listen to Greg Moore and you're part of Tree of Life, I know we've got some guests here and I love our guests, but this is limited connections. I need to keep it to tree people. But if you are in part of Tree of Life Church, you're not in our WhatsApp groups, uh, um, and you want that email link, send me an email and I will link you tomorrow morning to the Zoom meeting and you can join in at 8 o'clock. Okay, how do I get on the email list? That's a great question there. Um, right, let me type some stuff in here, okay? This is tree.church slash new equals get on email list. Okay, and it's the second one down. The first one gets you on our postal list and our database. The second one gets you on our email list. My email is ben at tree.church. So you can email me. Awesome, praise God. And then we're on Facebook at www.tree.church slash Facebook. And we're on Facebook at 2 p.m. every day, Monday to Friday. And Wednesday night at 8 is Richard Waller. Man, I loved what Richard had to say Wednesday night. It was so good. And um, Richard Waller and Friday night is a healing meeting. And I'm looking to get that out to maybe one of the other pastors as well. Because I want you to hear, we've got such a great team in Tree of Life. And I want you to hear those voices as well. Praise God. Awesome. I hope that's helped. Uh, we'd love to hear the message you preached in the end times in Chelmsford some time ago. Um, I think I've got them as MP3 somewhere, Wendy. If I do, I'll get them uploaded to Amazon and we'll get them on the app somewhere. And we could definitely do that. Um, and that would be really good. That would be good. Awesome. Yeah, the next set of emails is not going to be quite the same. What I preached in Chelmsford, my darling was um, really verse by verse, not quite verse by verse, but you know, through Revelation, I started to think chapter 6 and went right through to the end of Revelation, and um, you know, who's the Antichrist, and um, that kind of stuff, it's Napoleon, isn't it, it's Hitler, oh no, he's dead, Henry Kissinger, no, can't be him, no, we're not going to assign a name to the Antichrist, but we learned a little bit more about him, but more than that, we learned more about the Christ, and uh, he's the reason we study the end, because he's coming back one day, and he who has that hope in him purifies himself. And that's really what inspired Seymour to leave that life, leave his old life behind and step forward in faith and do everything God called him to do was this revelation that Christ is coming back. And he is. Amen. Well, I don't want to go. I don't want to go home. I'm home, but you know what I mean. I don't want to end this meeting. I love you guys so much, but we're going to have to come to an end. So I'm going to wave at the screen now. And that wave is just lets me know, because I know there's a little bit of a time delay, that it's time for me to click this button on here. So love you guys. Love you guys. We want more. The Lees want more. Give us more. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. We want to see more. Amen. The one-eyed man who could see more for the kingdom. Praise God. Awesome. Have I missed the wave? Have I missed it? Awesome. 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 Praise God. You can't come in and just be love heart, love heart, love heart as your username. Praise God. Thank you guys so much. I think I've missed the wave. It can't be that long a delay, can it? I wave again. There you go. Second wave. That's the second wave of the Spirit today. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, hallelujah. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 I've only got 40 minutes left. I only gave myself an hour and a half. I must have taught a while. Praise God. I thank you guys for being so patient with me. There's 70 people still connected. That's just beautiful. They say that for every connection. It's 1.6 people watching. So if there's two you're watching, one of you is a 0.6 of a person. So 70 is definitely over 100. My goodness me. That's awesome for an evening service, isn't it? Praise God. Praise God. Awesome. Bye. Okay. I've done it. I'll see you more.